Welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to um, welcome each and every one of you to our roundtable discussion today on the component separation technique with such an esteemed panel. Um, however, as I don't want to take the pleasure of introducing each and every one of our panelists away from, from our host, Professor Berger, I'm just going to focus on the organizational side of things. Um, all questions uh, that might arise during, during our session today, um, we will collect in the chat and uh, via the raise hand um, feature in, in, your, in your Zoom. And we will go through them uh, at the end of, of our four presentations in a hopefully open and interesting discussions between the panelists and each and every one of uh, you spectators. Um, please do be aware that today's sessions, as all our sessions before, is being recorded and will be used for fur further promotional and educational use. Um, yeah. That's really it, I think, for, for this time from my side. And now I will just directly hand over to Professor Berger, one, as every one of you probably knows, the, one of the foremost experts on, on anything hernia in Europe, definitely in Germany, um, and all around uh, great guy. <laughs> so let me just hand over to, to Dieter, um, yeah, the stage is yours, and I'll just stay quiet now for the rest of the session. Thank you, Konstantin. Nothing is true what you have told about me. Um, I would also like to welcome all participants and especially our speakers. The topic today is uh, the component separation technique, or the topic, the main topic is the treatment of major abdominal wall defects. We have the opportunity to hear four ex experts about two different procedures, or yeah, two different procedures. One is the Lira procedure, which is presented by uh, Julio Menquero, who is one of the most experienced surgeons in the Lira uh, field, but not only in the Lira field, of course. And this is the technique, as I understood, for the not very big, but quite big hernias, followed by Dr. Camillo Bertoglio from Milan, from Milano, who is, as I am, a general uh, a GI surgeon and who told me that he likes GI surgery and he has, is also concentrated on uh, major abdominal wall defects and performs the open TAR uh, procedure. Professor Ulrich Dietz is um, from Solothurn in Switzerland, and he will present as well the TAR, but the robotic TAR. And Uli starts years ago as an excited GI surgeon. He changed to a hernia surgeon, and he come back, come back uh, to a GI surgeon. And I think now he is again a really very experienced and also excited surgeon of the whole GI tract using the robotic. And at the end, after these three single surgeons series or single series, we hear what really happens in the broad field of surgery. And Dr. Pereira from Barcelona will show us the results of the Spanish registry, which is a well-documented uh, registry. And I think this is a very important point at the end, showing the difference between efficacy, which means what happens in a single surgeon's hands, compared with effectiveness, which means what happens in the broad field of surgery. So I'm quite proud uh, to be asked that I can moderate this very interesting session. And I would like to ask Julio to start with the Lira technique. Julio, please. And I'm sorry, please remember, this is for the speakers, please remember that uh, we have only eight minutes per presentation and I'm well known to be a very strict moderator and I will kill the line if you have too much time. 
only the line, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Julio, please start. Okay. <laughs> I would like to thank Dr. Berg and Cardiolin for the invitation to be here today for presenting a new technique for abdominal wall reconstruction performed by minimal invasive surgery. The development of laparoscopic ventral any repair in 1993 reported by LeBlanc provided good results in terms of morbidity of the surgical wound, a post-operative comfort, but it starts a new debate since the <coughs> interperitoneal placement of a mesh bridging a defect might increase the bulging effect and reduce the functionality of the abdominal wall too. Chelala in 2007 was the first who reports a routine defect with a good result in a laparoscopic ventral and repair in a series of 400 cases. And IPON Plus in the last EHS, uh, EHS guidelines shows a better satisfaction for patients, better functionality, less recurrence, and seroma formation compared to classic IPON. But almost 10 years after Chelala, Wenerhen reported for the first time that the tension generated in the midline after defect closure in medium large defect can increase the pain and the recurrence rate. This meta analysis reported by Tandon in British General Surgery concludes that all the defects smaller than six centimeters can be closed, repaired using a technique of component separation. But uh, uh, those bigger than 10 centimeters have to be repaired using a technique of component separation. But uh, what happens in those medium side defects uh, between six and 10? There's no evidence that the closure of the defect ensures a long lasting repair. He also mentioned the importance of uh, a mesh defect radio to avoid the recurrence. The Danish crew analyzed the result of the permanent related to the fixation in 2,400 patients after IPON plus technique and the group of permanent tax had a lower rate of recurrence. So the tension in IPON plus might be a risk factor of recurrence. Again, the overlap is important. And as we know, the patient influences too. So the surgeon, uh, several factors have to be considered for the surgeon before to choose the technique of abdominal wall reconstruction. In this way, we analyzed it, our results in IPON plus series of 60 patients from 2013 to 2015, and we performed a CT scan one year after the surgery, and we observed a 7% of recurrence and a 20% of asymptomatic pseudo recurrence, the bulging, most of them in defects between four to nine centimeters, and we studied the way to improve that. That was uh, 2015 when we developed the LIDA technique, a new procedure uh, that we published in 2018, our results in order to reduce the tension uh, closing the defects from M2, uh, M1 to M4 defects and W2 following the EHS classification. We excluded all the defects uh, no suitable for uh, all the patients, no suitable for laparoscopic ventral hernia repair with strangular hernias, M5 suprapubic hernia, or those uh, patients with prior interperitoneal meshes or an absence uh, of a, a posterior rectus shield. The first step is the general position of the patient. Uh, the patient is positioned in supine and a 10 millimeter and a 30 degree optic uh, we used. Three trockers, uh, three ports, 12 millimeters and five millimeters for the left axillary line. And the most important in this step is to preserve the posterior sheath intact. That is important in this step because we are going to use later. The second step is the hernia defect uh, measurement. We measure, uh, measure the defect using a surgical rule and we estimate the flap using a mathematical formula. The site of the flap is the transversal diameter divided by two. In defect is smaller, we can perform the incision at justice to the edge of the defect. Later, we perform the mobilization of the flaps uh, to the midline that are usually easy to move, but we must to be careful in this maneuver. In patients with a diastasis, 
or incision algenia of the whole uh, midline, uh, we uh, perform this flap in the whole midline. The next step is the uh, suture of both flaps together. Can be performed with a continuous barber suture, completely interperitoneal, that we introduce through a 12 millimeter stroker. Uh, there is a trick to avoid the whole thread inside the abdominal cavity, that's to extract the thread with a reveder needle uh, that we introduce in the bottom of the, of the suture. Uh, in another way, we can perform a closure with a monofilament that we introduce in the bottom of the flaps in a loop, it's a monofilament loop, and we finish on the top with an extracorporeal knot. It's important during this step, it's very important to reduce the pneumoperitoneum pressure to 10 millimeters. Finally, the last step is to perform a reinforcement of the aponeuroplasty with an interperitoneal mesh. And we estimate the size of the mesh, again, following a mathematical formula too, that considers the site of the original defect. In this case, the formula is the mesh size is the transversal diameter of the defect plus the flap size plus two centimeters to guarantee an overlap of the mesh to the fascia uh, in both sides. During the fixation of the mesh, it's important an external crown and an internal crown that we fix to the, to the uh, closure, to the flaps closure. We use fibrin glue to cover the tacks to avoid the adhesions of the, of the bowel to the, to the tacks. After five years and a series of 49 patients of Lita Technic with a medium follow up of 27 months, we have seen that in defects between four to 10. Uh, centimeters uh, W2, the distance between both rectus muscle in Lira uh, series keeps the distance compared to our series of IPON Plus that shows an increase of the distance and a 20% of volume. So Lira is more stable repair. And if you uh, see the last EHS guidelines, so recommends to invent an hernia with concomitant diastasis. So uh, uh, currently, as we perform a stressless suture, a closure, this is the reason because currently we started to use survival tax in order to reduce the adhesion. This is the present because Lira is a long-term stable repair in our experience. And what's the future? We don't know, but this might be the future. This is a case of a Lira repair with an survival mesh in a second look after three years due to colonic cancer. The mesh is completely integrated and there is a new linear alba. Anyway, further studies uh, will be necessary to reach conclusions in this way. So I will recommend in W2 defects for surgeon who begins with a minimal invasive abdominal wall reconstruction, LIDA is a safe and reproducible technique with a good long-term uh, results. Extraperitoneal techniques are a very good option too, but are more complex. So message to take home is useful in midline medium defects. It's a good resource for any patient, even those with an increase of recurrence, and it's important adequate overlap, but we can reduce, um, we can reduce the permanent fixation. And finally, it's an easy and reproducible technique for any surgeon uh, with a low complexity. I would like to end by offering the possibility of uh, helping uh, to any surgeon who wants to learn this technique uh, 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 if he if he's interested. And you, you have here in the screen a QR code where you, uh, you can uh, see the presentation. And you have my mail and my Twitter account. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julio, for your very nice presentation. Mm -hmm. I think now it's really clear what Lira means. Are there any very urgent questions which we have to answer immediately? Or can the questions wait un at, until the end of the, uh, of the other three presentations? There's there's one question. Um,
do you recommend to close the hernia defect prior to the elaboration of the technique? Yes, you had done it. You have shown the, the procedures. You have shown the, the, the results of your procedure. Uh, well, uh, the technique is to close the defect. And you have yeah, to yeah. close the defect performing a flap. So uh, this question, you don't close the hernia defect prior to the elaboration to the technique. The technique is to close the defect. Last short question, which is the difference between Lira and E Lira? When we uh, uh, talk about E Lira, we are talking about a H Lira. So we are talking about to open the posterior fascia very close to the edge of the hernia, to the ring of the hernia, because uh, it's a very small flap. Uh, when we have a small defects, we open uh, close to the defect, and this is the difference between a lira and lira, but there's no difference, it's the same technique. Okay, Dr. Morales, very good presentation, Dr. Gomez Monchero, thanks for sharing and congratulations. The question of Dr. Dahlenbeck will be discussed at the end because uh, this is a very interesting one <laughs> and we don't forget it, Dr. Dahlenbeck, we don't forget it. So. Probably we can proceed with uh, Camilo Batoglio to talk about the um, TAR, mm -hmm. the open TAR. Camilo? Okay. Thank you, Professor Berger, uh, for your kind invitation to this. Uh, Nice uh, webinar. Uh, I'm talking about uh, posterior component separation. I uh, will briefly introduce uh, our experience. Uh, the first uh, uh, things that I would like to emphasize uh, is uh, that when we are talking uh, about component separation technique, uh, we must take for granted that we are talking uh, about uh, uh, complex abdominal wall hernia. And it doesn't mean that we refer all only to large hernia, but uh, the, the criteria for defining a complex ventral hernia are clearly related to both the patients and the clinical respect. So at our institution uh, a few years ago, uh, we began asking ourselves uh, how, uh, how we can deal uh, and which uh, would be the proper uh, surgical uh, uh, indication for uh, such complex abdominal wall hernia, like in this case, uh, a man uh, under immunosuppressive therapy with huge uh, multi-recurrent median hernia, or in case uh, like this lateral sighted lumbar hernia with massively disrupted uh, lateral muscles, and finally, in uh, uh, cases like this loss of domain uh, hernia in patients with the severely uh, COPD and uh, with previous history of uh, uh, delay uh, wound healing. Definitely uh, what we could do for these patients. Uh, actually, in our previous experience of uh, uh, laparoscopic uh, ventral hernia repair, we pushed uh, uh, to face the limits of this technique when dealing with uh, complex ventral hernia in terms of uh, poor postoperative uh, outcomes that I briefly listed in the slides. And for this reason, uh, in the end, uh, we found the, uh, the the answers to the questions that we were looking for uh, when in 2012, uh, uh, transversus abdominis uh, release was first uh, described uh, with the uh, work of uh, uh, Novinsky. Uh, basically, a uh, uh, TAR procedure is uh, uh, a component separation technique that allow for uh, a wide dissection of the retromuscular and uh, preperitoneal uh, space uh, that uh, after the opening uh, of the posterior uh, sheet of the internal oblique muscles and after the fibers of the transverse muscle are divided, uh, enter a pathway uh, and a vascular pathway uh, that could uh, lead us uh, to reach the real uh, anatomical boundaries uh, of uh, the abdomen. Definitely, I think that uh, no other uh, component separation technique could uh, allow for such an extensive uh, uh, dissection. 
but this is not uh, the only advantage that has been uh, uh, demonstrated for uh, uh, TAR procedures. Uh, another is the avoidance uh, of the uh, subcutaneous uh, uh, section that is uh, strictly necessary in cases of uh, uh, Ramirez procedure, uh, for, uh, for example, and the preservation of the lateral neurovascular bundles. All of these things uh, uh, provide them for uh, uh, potential impressive uh, functional uh, outcomes, uh, anatomical outcomes uh, over time. Uh, for these, uh, because of these uh, uh, favorable uh, results uh, derived from the large series, uh, at least uh, in terms of uh, recurrence, surgical site uh, occurrence, uh, quality of life, and core stability, uh, TAR procedures uh, increasingly uh, uh, grow uh, interest uh, interest in the surgical community, and uh, to me uh, the 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 most important uh, value of uh, this technique is uh, its uh, extreme uh, versatility that probably makes it uh, uh, the procedure of choice in the vast majority of uh, complex ventral hernia repair. And also the international guide in the, uh, adapted uh, the, the statement to the growing evidence of effectiveness uh, in cases of uh, wide uh, lateral sighted and bent line hernias. And when it comes to our experience uh, working in a general uh, leading hospital, uh, hosting all uh, uh, the disciplines uh, and technology, and my uh, department is uh, a general surgery department involved ma in major uh, oncologic surgery. Uh, we are not dedicated only to uh, abdominal wall repair. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, a clinical uh, environment uh, like this is important when dealing with the complex patients. As you can see in our series of uh, 70 patients since uh, 2014, uh, nearly 30% uh, uh, presented with uh, relevant comorbidities uh, that you know um, frequently deserve uh, the, av the availability of uh, uh, intensive care units beds for the post-operative course. The versatility of the procedures is witnessed by uh, the heterogeneity of uh, our uh, series, uh, but with a, a clear prevalence uh, of uh, defects larger than 10 centimeters uh, and more than 50% of, of patients with uh, not midline uh, and 30% uh, uh, of recurrent hernias. Uh, apart for uh, the operative time that is clearly uh, quite uh, uh, time consuming, uh, a procedure time consuming due to the uh, accurate and careful dissection that is uh, frequently quite demanding, especially in cases of multi recurrent uh, uh, area with disrupt disruption of the posterior plane. Uh, I think that in our experience, uh, length of hospital stay was uh, uh, related mainly to the presence of uh, uh, patients risk factor. Uh, nonetheless, we reported uh, uh, a relatively low incidence of surgical site occurrence uh, with uh, an incidence of surgical site infection of 7% that is consistent with uh, those described in the literature. And with an amazing uh, uh, and quite surprising incidence of recurrence under 2%, even though we have uh, uh, a relatively short uh, follow-up. In all cases treated uh, at our institution, we perform a, a posterior component separation uh, using uh, large sheets of uh, uh, polyvinyl denafluoride meshes that allowed us to uh, um, obtain uh, uh, adequate overlap and permanent repair. And just in future, Cases, a uh, uh, few selected cases, uh, we uh, found that the adoption uh, of a concomitant uh, by a solvable uh, mesh could play an important role uh, for the purpose of the permanent repair. But this uh, is uh, surely uh, a controversial issue that maybe uh, could be further discussed uh, later on. In conclusion, uh, uh, even though uh, it would be simply fantastic if uh, uh, TAR. Uh, could offer a unique solution for all kinds of uh, complex hernia, 
And although I am clearly biased toward uh, this technique instead of any other kind of component separations, I think that we should give a message of awareness of the potential uh, drawbacks and pitfalls that uh, are related when uh, this technique is uh, uh, improperly adopt adopted, especially uh, when we are dealing uh, with such uh, a challenging, challenging uh, comorbid uh, uh, patient populations. And so probably uh, this procedure should be reserved in high volume centers, at least for abdominal wall surgery and uh, avoiding uh, demanding a clinical scenario that I listed in the slides and uh, with careful selection of the patient who may benefit the most from this procedure. And also trying to uh, address the modifiable uh, patient's risk, uh, risk factor in the preoperative settings before planning uh, such a challenging procedure. I think that uh, my presentation has come to an end. I'm looking forward to for the discussion and thank you again. Thank you very much, Camilo. Also a very nice and impressive presentation about your results and your technique. Are there any urgent questions? in the audience. Not at the moment. <clears throat> Not at the moment. So Thank you very much once more. We will come back. Thank you. Yes. What is the ser what is the seroma and hematoma rate? And what tricks do you use to reduce the seroma hematoma rate? This was one question, Camilo. Uh, I show that uh, we included the uh, seroma in uh, our percentage of uh, surgical site occurrences. Uh, so it's in 12% uh, uh, of uh, uh, that I described. Uh, seroma that needs uh, uh, treatment uh, were less than uh, invasive treatment, at least uh, were less than uh, 5%. And um, for what concern, uh, uh, advise uh, uh, to reduce uh, hematoma. That is, uh, of course, another kind of uh, surgical site occurrences. Um, the only advice is to be careful uh, with the uh, hemostasis uh, at the end of the dissection because uh, it's frequent uh, uh, observe, we have uh, frequently observed um, some bleeding uh, from the uh, detachment of the, the transverse uh, muscle fibers. And to uh, another advice is to drain it correctly, uh, but uh, the bleeding uh, uh, never um, never was uh, uh, a true problem uh, in, in our experience. In our experience, and just in one case, we had uh, a bleeding uh, from the uh, damage of the epigastric vessels that needs uh, uh, a percutaneous uh, um, procedures in the postoperative course. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, oh, there are some questions, please, uh, we, will, we will answer these questions after, at the end, at the end of the fourth presentation, and I would like to start with, uh, or would like to ask Uli to start his presentations. Do you see the screen? I see the screen. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dieter, for the invitation. And it is an honor to be with you here in this webinar. And it's not so easy for me to talk about um, this topic after uh, so um, um, very, very, very good presentations before me. But um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the transversus abdominis release. Sorry, if I may just interrupt shortly. Um, is it just me? I do not see your presentation right now. If everyone else sees it, then maybe there's no problem, then it's my problem, but I do not. There we go. Okay. Is it better now? Yeah, thank you. 
so um, we we had for several years classical ways to approach the abdominal wall and we learned that the retromuscular repair um, and the preperitoneal repair and for some time the intraperitoneal repair had advantages over the inlay and the onlay repairs and you can see most of these procedures in the beginning of the treatment of incisional hernias were um, done in an open fashion. Uh, but um, time um, evoluted and we developed new ways to approach the abdominal wall. So the first um, um, new um, tool that we had to approach abdominal wall was the uh, anterior component separation. And the second one um, is the posterior component separation or the so-called TAR transversus abdominis release. So the, the onlay and the inlay meshes, um, they are a little bit forgotten in a, in a large sense, in small series, people are working on this. And the IPO mesh, um, I foresee that the tendency is that the IPO mesh will be an exception also. But you can see here in this um, screen that the nerves that innervate the abdominal wall, they transit between the transverse muscle and the internal obliquo muscle. And so this is the most um, important part of the procedure for the long-term well-being of patients. Because if we damage the nerves uh, in this part of the procedure, the patient will have an atrophy of the musculature um, and um, physiological problems in the long run. So nowadays we have a new anatomy of the abdominal wall. This is the transverse abdominus release showed in an open fashion. You can see here the linea alba. This is the posterior rectus sheet. And the lateral part of the procedure rectus sheet in the tar is detached from the muscles, muscles um, from the transverse muscle. And it's very interesting to see, and one of the questions was about seroma, and I will come back on this, that in the lower part of the abdomen, in the caudal part of the abdomen, the uh, fascia of the muscle, of the transverse muscle will keep attached to the transverse muscle, and here we will have only peritoneum. And in the upper part of the abdomen, the fascia of the transverse muscle will be detached and will be part of the peritoneum. Here we can see the rib cage and the diaphragm and the xiphoid. So in this part of the preparation, I think um, probably um, is, is, is the is the anatomical part who is responsible for the postoperative bleedings and also for the seromas. In this picture, as you can see here in the lower part of, uh, in the caudal part of the preparation, that we are going here from the ratio space to the bogros space at the arcuate line. So here you can see the arcuate line and we are going down to up with the release with the incision of the lateral part of the transverse abdominis. And in the infraumbilical part, um, if we have here the uh, posterior rectal sheet, we will have only the peritoneum because the fascia of the transversus will be attached to the transverse muscle. In the upper part, it is different. We will see that the fascia of the transverse muscle will be attached to the peritoneum instead of the muscle. Um, here you can see the um, lateral part of the transversus muscle. Here is the rectal muscle, the rib cage, um, the transverse muscle, and the diaphragm. So this is a complete new view, and uh, maybe this is the most um, challenging part of the procedure to um, uh, know and to see exactly if we are dealing with the transverse muscle um, over here, of if, or if we are dealing with the 
a diaphragm. It, it would be a pity and maybe dangerous to transect the diaphragm in this part. Um, I, I will not show videos because my time is so short and uh, this procedure is not quicker than the open procedure. We have, we need also um, four hours per procedure like uh, the speaker before me, but I would like to show that we have to dock from both sides. So this is the right side. Here is the line of the uh, transverse abdominal release. And this is the posterior rectal sheet. In this picture, the posterior rectal sheet is being closed. In this picture, the anterior fascia is being closed. And after all, we in, put a large mesh. We cover the mesh with an hemostypticum with arista. Uh, trying to reduce the incidence of the uh, postoperative bleeding. Um, please believe me that during the procedure, we see almost no blood at all. And it is, it is so disappointing to have in the postoperative time um, blood in the drains. So I'm, I'm not quite sure yet why um, it is so. We have um, started to reduce the, uh, the pressure of the pneumoperitoneum for about five minutes before um, um, uh, detaching the robot, but this is still a problem. So I use two drains and, um, um, and, and, and take them out on the second or third postoperative day before discharging the patients. So those are the typical postoperative findings this was preoperative, and here you can see um, it is interesting. The well, the mesh is very um, large in size, but it's interesting that the lateral or the medial attachment of the rectal muscle of the transverse muscle still is there after six months. So there is no retraction from the transverse muscle despite um, <clears throat> the transverse abdominal release. In the literature, what we see in this uh, 320 cases is that the defects treated with the robotic tar is uh, between uh, six to 15 centimeters. Um, um, the procedural time is uh, almost the same as in the open procedure. The incidence of seroma, um, uh, infected seroma and hematoma is uh, low and the incidence is even lower or significantly lower than in the open procedures. Um, the reoperation rate is very low also. And this is the loss of stay, the, the length of stay is probably one of the most impressive things. And mm -hmm. the explanation mm -hmm. uh, that we learned here is that since we do not touch the intestines during the whole procedure. The patients have immediately bowel movements after the procedure. And so they don't need to recover from the uh, procedure. This is uh, what I told you before. Those are the drains uh, at the first postoperative day. But you also can see this um, um, not so optimal aesthetics of the subcutaneous tissue. So how can we deal with this? We have the seroma and the prolonged postoperative bleeding. One explanation is that the, the, the flux of peritoneal fluids is from down to up and the resorption of the peritoneal fluids is through the diaphragm. And if we uh, detach the peritoneum with all these microstructures with this lymphatic stomata and, and this complex structure um, responsible for the homeostasis of the abdominal cavity. And if we denude the transverse muscle, uh, this probably will be the cause of this bleeding and of this seromas that we have. And the problem of the aesthetics is being addressed with the so-called hybrid uh, procedures, hybrid procedures, um, uh, we, we make the whole procedure from intra-abdominal laparoscopically with the robot. We close the posterior fascia. And then uh, until this point of the procedure, we, we avoid absolutely to touch the bowels. Exception is 
if we have to perform an endosolysis. And then in the, in the hybrid procedure, we open the skin, we um, resect the excess of skin and close the fascia over the mesh that uh, was already positioned. The results are quite good in this series from uh, Kutsi, the, the, the cosmetic uh, results and um, the, the restrictions of activities outside house and daily activities, they improve significantly after this procedure. So this is uh, what I would like to share with you. And I thank you very much, um, Dieter, for the opportunity to be here and to discuss this with you all. Thank you, Uli. As I would have expected, <laughs> an impressive and convincing presentation of the robotics and presentation of your results. Um, you also demonstrated some trick <laughs> concerning the prevention of the uh, of the seroma of the post-operative seroma. So, are there any? Uh, any important questions, urgent questions from the audience, which we have to answer right now, or can we proceed with the presentation of Dr. Pereira? We we do have a raised hand in the audience from okay. Linda Karyuki. I don't see it. I um, gave the ability to speak now. Yeah. If she wants to ask a question, Linda Karyuki. I don't hear anything. Maybe later then. The microphone of Linda is off. Yeah, I I can only I can only ask her to unmute herself. I cannot mute it uh, unmute it from here. Okay. So. Um, Uli, one very short question. What about the aesthetics? If you wait until six months before you correct, uh, try to correct the, uh, the, the aesthetic problem, because in my experience, the, um, the problem resolves by itself. It is right. In most cases. It is right. If you explain to the patient before the procedure yeah. of the advantage of the minimally invasive approach and explain to them that they have to wait until the, 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 the scar is remodeled and, and then they, they, have, they understand this and they will wait. But the first days after procedure, they sometimes are a little bit um, disappointed with the aesthetics. Okay. I have to be honest with this. Okay, thanks. Thanks once more. So, Jose, I am very interested about the registry results what, what happens in the broad field of surgery, as I said at the beginning. Okay, thank you very much to Professor Berger and Diana Mesh for the invitation to participate on this webinar. Uh, sorry, wait a moment. Okay, did you see my, do you see my presentation? Okay, my, my talk uh, will be about the result, will not be about technique. Uh, I will speak about the results of the component separation technique in, in a larger, large, larger series of patients operated and registered in the Spanish Registry of Incisional Hernias, we call it uh, EVEREC. Uh, there is, uh, as you know, uh, as you can see, there is an increasing popularization of the abdominal wall component separation techniques to repair complex incisional hernia, but uh, the most of the results of outcomes uh, come from uh, uh, high volume centers or spaces, surgeons, abdominal wall surgeons. However, there is a lack of data in large multicenter cohort of patients. Uh, the objective of our study was to analyze the outcomes of component separation, both anterior and posterior, in patients registered in our Spanish registry of incisional hernia. This is our uh, systematic uh, for uh, the analysis. We analysis all, all, all incisional hernia repair with component separation technique from the, the registry in the period between July 
2012 to December 2019. And we analyzed the demographics, the characteristic of the hernia and surgery, and the long and short term uh, outcomes with a special interest in recurrences. We perform a descriptive and comparative univariate and multivariate analysis of risk factors for complications and for recurrences. This is the demographics, a total of uh, 1,536 patients. Uh, that is 13% uh, of the all cases registered. Uh, 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 almost 70% of patients were male, and the mean age was 64, and 30% uh, 30, uh, 30 of the patients were older of seven, uh, than 70 years. The median body mass index was 29.7 kilograms per uh, meter quadrat, and with uh, the obesity rate was, was uh, 48%. With, uh, so, and patients with a, a risk, a, a, a risk higher than three were 32%. This is a type of the hernia repair. Most of the operations were on midline hernias and the transverse size was up to 10%, 10, 10 centimeters, sorry, in 65%, 66% of all cases. Uh, previous repair were present in 31% of the patients of the and uh, 84 of the patients were classified as moderate of major complexity following the classification of Slater. 97% uh, of the page of the operation were elective were programmed and only 78 of, uh, per, of the procedures were performed by an um, in an abdominal wall uh, unit, specialized, in a specialized abdominal wall unit. The most common technique was the uh, anterior uh, technique in 78% of the uh, repairs, and, but it's increasing the number of uh, posterior techniques during the last years, and uh, uh, associated procedures were very frequent. Uh, the most frequent with bowel resection in 12% of the patients. Mesh repair was used in almost all cases. The most frequent type of mesh was a reticular synthetic mesh in 90% of patients when only one mesh was used. Uh, sometimes 24% of the patients receive two uh, meshes as a show it or colleague from Italia. And uh, the most frequent Position was on lay, but this is uh, uh, due to the most frequent anterior component of separation. But in uh, posterior uh, component separation, the most frequent position was sublay, and usually the mesh was secreted with a suture. Complications were very, very frequent where in the 36% of the patients. Uh, main part of them were clavian dindo type 2 or less. Uh, remarkably, there were 27% uh, of surgical site occurrences with a special imp uh, uh, presence in seroma in almost 15% of the patients with highly prevalence of wound infection and skin, skin necrosis in anterior approach. Posterior component separation was associated with a higher incidence of global complication, but without statistically significant and reoperation rate was 2.7% of patients. It was uh, mortality in 1.2% of the patients. And more complex hernias were related with a higher percentage of complications, as you can see in this table. After a logistic regression analysis, we uh, show that a higher rate of complications were related with morbid obesity and with a, a, a time, uh, some comorbidities. Uh, with uh, hernias larger than 10 centimeters in length and with previous repairs and with uh, associated uh, procedures and obviously with patients with higher anesthetic risks. That is a, a summary of the risk factor for complications, uh, morbid obesity, uh, a higher uh, ASA 
uh, score, previous repair, associated or concomitant procedures and the diameter longer than 10 centimeters. After a minimum follow-up of six months, 590 patients, that is uh, uh, almost 40% of the patients were followed and we have a 10% of recurrences. In the univariate uh, analysis, risk factors show a higher rate of recurrence were related with immunosuppression, uh, emergency repair, uh, the situ repair with uh, uh, only mesh and uh, in, with surgical uh, complications uh, with a special impact on seroma and surgical site occurrences. In the Cox multivariate analysis, when an operation was performed in a abdominal wall unit was correlated with better results with an ASA ratio of 4.9. This is the summary of the analysis of the recurrences factor uh, with higher uh, recurrences in with uh, higher, uh, longer uh, hernias with immunosuppression during emergency surgery we, when a mess is not used and, and with complications and uh, uh, lower recurrences, recurrences when the operation was performed in abdominal wall unit. And in conclusion, anterior and, component, and posterior component separation are complex surgical techniques with a high rate of complications. Elective surgery and operations performed and at a abdominal wall unit have better outcomes. And anterior and posterior component separation have similar rate of recurrences and complications. And you, as you can see, some patients have uh, smaller hernias and we have to uh, to call to beware of overtreatment. Thank you very much, and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much, Jose. Very interesting, nicely presented. So we will start with the discussion. Um, first of all, I think Julio. Please wake up. <laughs> now it's your turn. <laughs> okay, I'm here again. Um, there was one question of uh, Dr. Dahlenbeck. He asked what to do if you have a recurrence after Lira. Which procedure would you prefer or would you perform? That's a good question because uh, when you will perform a new procedure, you, you always uh, look for uh, to, to develop a procedure better than the before procedure you developed. So in this case, uh, in LIRA technique, uh, I think that we have to individualize, uh, it's very important in the individualization of the recurrence. Uh, it's not the same, a small recurrence in the top on the bottom of the prior LIRA, or a big recurrence with a pseudo recurrence and bulging associated with the mesh inside. Uh, if you have a small uh, lira, a small, a small recurrence uh, on the top and you have a prior lira and you have restored not the whole midline, you can develop or another iPhone or you can develop another lira in the other side. But uh, if you have, if you have, a big recurrence and you have a, a big uh, recurrence uh, with a mesh inside and you have to restore the midline completely, uh, I think that the best choice will be an anterior component separation. Okay. Are there further questions from the audience? I have one question concerning the um, concerning the um, the principle of the lira technique you close the midline mm -hmm. by the fascia mm -hmm. but you don't reconstruct the defect between the muscle the muscle edges are not adapted is it right the fascia is closed but the muscles are distant, uh, you, you leave the muscles distant, is it right? No, no, it's not true. Uh, when you close the, the muscle, when you close the defect and you close the fascia, the fascia uh, brings 
the muscle to the midline. No, uh, it's the same that is you uh, closure the muscle, but uh, when you close the, the, the edge, the, the fascia, uh, uh, the, the muscle are near uh, in our series, uh, you have a prior uh, defects of eight centimeters, but later in the CT scan, uh, they are uh, two centimeters of the midline. Okay, okay, thank you. There's another another question from. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I cannot I cannot read the the name completely. Um, the question is: Is Lira suitable uh, to be done to repair ventral and parastomal hernias together, Lira and Sugar Baker, for example? We have some cases of uh, Lira combined with another uh, interperitoneal. Uh, restorations. In this case, uh, a sugar baker, it will be possible. You close the midline with a LIDA technique and later you close the parastomal defect and you put an interperitoneal mesh covering the whole defect. Mm, okay. From my point of view, as uh, I have some experience with the, with the parastomal I, hernias. I in, know, I know. Uh, I would prefer the sandwich technique, <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> Sugar baker is absolutely adequate, of course. Um, Julio, uh, there's the question of another um, participant. Do you have ever seen skin, pl skin plication after diastasis repair with Lyra in tiny patients, skinny patients? When we close Lira, we are closing defects of uh, from four to 10 centimeters. If you have a big defect in a skinny patient, you have the risk of the, the skin, uh, maybe application, but it's in, in the moment, it's like an iPhone plus or another technique that you close the defect. Uh, if you if you, use, you use a banding later, most of the defects correct in the time, in the long, uh, long terms. So last question from, from me, what about the learning curve of this technique? Well, I think that is easier than uh, retromuscular techniques for a surgeon, but you have to be a surgeon uh, that usually uh, develop uh, abdominal wall reconstruction in, in, in abdominal wall uh, reconstruction in uh, bilab minimal invasive surgery. So I think it's important uh, to learn this technique with a surgeon uh, with the same or more experience than you in this way. I think this is short, it's not too long. In fact, in my, in my hospital, the surgeons are young, are young and they don't have so experience in abdominal wall reconstruction uh, by minimal invasive surgery and they learn quickly. Okay, thank you. Julio, now we will proceed to our uh, fans of component separation technique. There is one question of, uh, for all of you. Um, what about the rate of complications such as peritoneal lacerations as well as denovation of the rectus muscle? Uh, Camilo, what do you think? How much problems with laceration and denervation do you have? Well, what concerns the last question? So, denervation uh, and uh, neurovascular uh, damage, we do not have uh, any experience, uh, fortunately, uh, because I think that uh, when you correctly perform the uh, posterior component separation, uh, you should uh, stay away from this uh, kind of risk. And in our experience, uh, uh, this could be for sure uh, a scaring uh, postoperative complication, but uh, the most uh, serious uh, denervation that we have seen uh, was uh, concerning uh, lateral defects. Um, 
but frequently they presented uh, at the moment of surgery uh, already with uh, such uh, complication. Um, but I never seen in our experience uh, after, uh, for example, a, a midline uh, hernia, this kind of uh, outcomes uh, after TAR, uh, at least uh, at this uh, me, at my medium follow-up that, as I said, as I told before, is uh, relatively short. And for what concern uh, peritoneal uh, laceration, I don't know if uh, we can uh, consider them a, a real, a true complication, because you know when uh, you decide to go uh, on this plane, uh, prepared, completely preperitoneal, pre pre you must take into account to, uh, to do some uh, small or even a larger hole. But I think that you do not, do not have to be scared of because uh, in, in our experience, uh, it almost always uh, uh, possible to recover uh, uh, to integrity uh, dissolves. And um, especially, it, it will be challenging in case of, of uh, disruption of the posterior uh, sheets in case of uh, multi-recurrent uh, uh, hernia. Uh, but you know, it's a work of uh, patience. You have to proceed slowly uh, with careful uh, uh, dissection. And just in few cases, uh, as I mentioned, we used the uh, we adopted uh, an additional mesh when we were not uh, uh, when we were not so uh, so sure of uh, the uh, strength of the posterior sheet, or in some other case, we adopted the, uh, the using of a, a, a mesh suitable for IPOM uh, uh, implant, uh, so that we could cover the whole with a surface that could be uh, suitable for uh, interperitoneal uh, implants. Okay, Uli, what do you think? Is it easier with biorobotics? You know, with robotics, we have at least three holes that we have to suture are the peritoneal holes from the contralateral trocars. So at least there's three. And we will suture the posterior rectal sheet and the anterior rectal and the anterior fascia. Um, usually we have two to three additional um, holes that we can suture. Uh, it is not a matter of um, time um, to close this uh, small holes. And as Camilo told, if there should be a very large hole, you can use a patch from a vicral mesh and protect your mesh and you don't need to um, to use a very, very expensive mesh to correct this. So I, I would not be afraid with the small holes. Um, um, I don't think that we have to combine those meshes with other meshes um, only in, in exceptional situations. But what is very interesting also is that we can perform partial TARS. We can in lateral hernias, perform a lateral transverse abdominal release just on one side. For example, uh, a large hernia after stoma takedown. So you can have trouble to correct it, but you can perform a lateral transverse abdominal release or unilateral transverse abdominal release and, and, and correct the hernia in a very, very good way also. Um, so the, the um, I think that it is important to have in mind the new, um, the new um, uh, division of the abdominal wall and the resources that we have to tailor the mesh positioning for each patient. So it, it, in this context, do you think it's possible to do a sublay position on one side and uh, the tar position on the other side. I have done it in some cases, especially as you have said, after takedown of, a, of, a, of, an, of an ostomy. I have done this robotically also, exactly in this situation. A very large a 10 by 10 lateral incisional hernia after takedown of, of, a, mm -hmm. of an end colostomy. And uh, I, I solved this this way. 
to have a, 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 a sufficient medial overlap of the mesh, I entered um, through the posterior rectus sheet contralateral, and then, yeah. yeah okay. okay. Ended up with a tar. Dita, uh, yeah. there is one of the questions that I've seen about uh, obesity. May, may I show one slide to answer that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is a very important question. What should we do in, in obese patients? And I think it is important for us. Um, are you seeing the screen? Yeah. yeah. It is important for us that we are not um, the only um, um, doctors, physicians, and surgeons that treat one patient. So if the patient comes with an hernia and is obese, we have to stop thinking about operate the patient and think what's the best for the patient. And in the emergency situation, there is no way we have to treat the, the hernia. But there are semi-elective procedures, highly symptomatic hernias, where we can treat first the hernia and then proceed to a bariatric uh, procedure later. But the ideal situation would be here, the last one, if we first treat the patient bariatrically, and then nine to 12 months later, uh, usually these patients, they, they lose uh, enough weight for a simultaneous hernia repair in a plastic surgery. So then we really solve the problem of the patient with a um, reduced risk of recurrence and of complications. Okay, thank you. I will come back to this point. <laughs> um, Jose, what says the Spanish registry about the complications of denervation and um, peritoneal laceration um, after TAR or? Uh, I, I don't have this, this data, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. I have my experience about it. Exactly. Uh, that was that would be my next question. <laughs> in, uh, in my personal experience, uh, tears of the peritoneum in open surgery are very frequent. And you have to close, and if you have a, a large tear, you may use, as uh, Uli said, a, a piece of bike, for example. But uh, as you uh, have seen in the in the results of the registry. Not all the surgeons are uh, feel comfortable with that. Uh, so the 24% of the patients have two meshes, two superposed meshes. So a large uh, number of these patients have a biosynthetic and after a reticular polypropylene mesh. Uh, that's, it depends on the surgeons. I, um, I don't used to do that, but I understand the, uh, the fear of the surgeons to have a, a problem with the bowel and during the postoperative period. And uh, one point about the denervation. Uh, posterior component separation was designed to avoid denervation. And this is very clear. If you do uh, the proper technique, you don't have denervation. But there is uh, one exception. If you do a reverse star, a reverse star in a lateral, in a big lateral hernia, you may have denervation because the course of the nerves is not the same at the midline than in the lateral part. So be careful when you make a transverse a section of the transverse muscle in the lateral part because you will have probably a denervation if the patient <laughs> don't have the denervation prior to the surgery. But, but because it's very frequent that the patient comes from, from us without uh, the innovation. Mm. Okay. So, thank you. There is um, one further sorry. question. Sorry, Dieter, we have a yeah. question with a raised hand uh, from Raul yeah. Adel, who's ready to speak, I believe. Yeah. We will hear. Raul? So? Unfortunately, I don't hear it. Okay, the mic is unmuted. Just music. 
then continue. Apologies. We will we will try it later later on. Okay. Uh, are some of you or do some of you have experience with a lateral recurrence after a TRR after transverse abdominis release? Is one further question? Lateral recurrence? No. No, nobody has well, experience. What, what does this mean, lateral recurrence? Do you mean a lateral hernia, for example, after stoma takedown and then um, a recurrence? Because the, the overlap of the mesh with the TAR is at least 15 centimeters to each side. So it's a very huge overlap. And I have not seen recurrence lateral to this huge mesh. We could have a practice uh, almost the whole abdominal wall until the, uh, uh, we reach the, the, the um, gerota fascia. So it is a very, very huge covering with mesh. The problem in these cases is when you use a short piece of mesh. You have to always use a big piece of mesh. And if you use a short, shorter, you may have a lateral flank area. Uh, in our experience, uh, yeah, if I can uh, add uh, uh, some uh, something to what they currently say, uh, the recurrence uh, was uh, after a, a partial uh, uh, TR procedure for a subsified uh, uh, small uh, incisional hernia, and in this case uh, we used uh, was um, a case in, in which we didn't use large sheet of, uh, uh, of mesh. And so uh, the recurrence uh, occur in the caudal part uh, of, uh, of the mesh uh, toward the midline, because we were scared uh, of the overlap uh, on, uh, on the succified space. And probably we uh, underestimate uh, the the size of the mesh. And for what concern uh, uh, lateral hernia, we do not experience uh, uh, in any case uh, 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 recurrence on the lateral side, uh, because uh, as they say, if you used for uh, larger defects, uh, huge, air, uh, huge uh, meshes, I, I don't think that is, uh, it is a problem. Uh, what we observe in some cases is the pseudo recurrence of the lateral uh, uh, side because of, uh, uh, as we say before, of the denervation that was present before uh, the procedure, but just pseudo recurrence. I mean, bulging, of course. Thanks, thanks. Um, one question to Jose Pereira. Uh, and the registry, what's the percentage of minimal invasive surgical component separation in your registry? And do you have a cutoff value to send the patient to bariatric surgery prior to repair of complex hernias? Uh, there's two separate questions. There, to the first, in this score, there is no patients with minimally invasive surgery because uh, we have registered a, a small number of patients. I, I, I thought that this will uh, make a bias in, in the results. We have to wait more time to have more patients registered to analyze these patients and probably the results in uh, minimal invasive surgery, in, especially in, in posterior component separation in TAR, will be better than in open. It, it's my hope more than an experience. My hope is that uh, will be less surgical site occurrences with minimally invasive uh, techniques. But we have to wait in the, to, to have more patient registered to analyze that. And uh, we have focused our, our results of a study only in open surgery. And the second one was uh, <laughs> well, if we have a cutoff. Uh, uh, in Spain, we have a, a problem, this uh, the waiting list. If you send the patient to the obesity surgeon, probably the patient will be waiting two or three years 
to be operated on, on morbid obesity. And uh, it's a problem. And many patients uh, don't, don't uh, have the uh, good indication because some patients are older with comorbidities and uh, uh, no. obesity surgeons are not comfortable with this kind of patients. Um, it's, a, it's a very uh, huge problem. Um, sometimes we, are, uh, we have to operate the patient with a larger BMI uh, because the patient want to be operated and it's very difficult in our uh, health mm. system to be opposite. Uh, I try to send the patients to the endocrinologist to uh, try to lower the, the weight, but it's, sometimes it's very difficult. And that is uh, the reason that we have uh, many patients with obesity and some patients with uh, a large uh, proportion of patients with morbid obesity operated on. Okay, one question um, I would like to ask is, um, you, to you, you showed, if I am right, that the anterior component uh, technique, MPN component separation technique, has more than, has patients in a rate of more than 70% with a wide, with a width of the defect of more than 10 centimeters, whereas the TAR patients, posterior component separation technique, is seem to be smaller. The, pa the defect seems to be smaller. Uh, that is the real world. Uh, some, okay. uh, yeah, uh, probably uh, some surgeons start to operate uh, with uh, a TAR in some patients that I'm not sure that this uh, will be uh, would be indicated now. Uh, uh, probably these uh, dimensions will increase uh, with the time, uh, but it's true. Uh, the defects were smaller, but the area of the defects are smaller in all the the cohort when compares with other cohorts in specialized centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably because it's a, a large a, a number of surgeons and centers, and there is a, a bias due to that. And probably overtreatment is a problem. You have to uh, be sure that the patient needs a component separation to do that. Yeah, but the question is whether it's overtreatment or whether the anterior component separation technique provides a little bit more of the myofascial advancement because I, I, I don't think so i don't think so because it, this is uh, due to uh, the, the uh, anterior component separation was uh, implemented in our armamentary of surgeons before the posterior component separation and uh, that's the reason for, in my opinion eh, for that this difference uh, that uh, um, uh, surgeons are used are more used to do anterior component separation than posterior, and that's the reason that uh, larger defects are operated with anterior component separation. I, 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 more patients are uh, operated. Uh, I have uh, done this uh, the, the same uh, analysis uh, some years ago, and. The, uh, the defects of posterior compression were lower yes. uh, two years ago and are being increasing during these two years that my, my uh, previous analysis. Mm, okay. Okay. So um, <laughs> there is one technical question uh, to Uli Dietz. To my observation from the forums and so on, uh, most surgeons use a 30 by 30 centimeter mesh in robotic tar, and I think also in open tar. Um, open tar, no, he said open tar re demands quite larger meshes. What would you say? Uh, this is a very good question. I think that uh, we are dealing with two different techniques. Um, to make the uh, posterior component separation all the way through the diaphragm and all the way to the, to the um, retius space. Um, 
you will need to open the whole linear alba to reach these regions. So if you have uh, an incisional hernia with 20 centimeters of length or with 18 centimeters of length, uh, you, you will need technically to increase the opening of the linear alba uh, to reach all these spaces. And then for sure, um, um, you need a very large piece of mesh because you need to um, secure the whole incision. This may be one uh, answer. The other is that um, laterally in the width of the mesh, we are um, robotically and also in open procedures with 15 centimeters of overlap at each side. We, we are quite good. So if we look at the data of the robotic procedures, a lot of them are reporting of hernia gaps with a length of 20 to 15 centimeters. I'm not talking about the width. The width is no um, in discussion here. So uh, if, I don't in, if I don't open, if I don't enlarge this hernia gap, um, I am uh, with, with a mesh of 30 by 30, I am, I am, um, um, uh, complying with the requirements of uh, at least five to 10 centimeters of overlap. So I think it probably this is one, one explanation. Um, but um, important is that you have to um, um, have an overlap of at least um, five to 10 centimeters in this, in, in the longitudinal um, uh, way behind the xiphoid and behind the pubic bone. Okay. I would like to hear uh, um, Camilo's uh, opinion on this. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we uh, we do not have experience uh, with the robotic uh, tar. Uh, but I basically agree. Uh, I think that. Uh, uh, at least in our experience, uh, the dimension, as I say, I think that TAR is uh, uh, a true uh, versatile uh, tool in the hands of the surgeon. And I do not uh, think that uh, large, huge mesh are uh, always uh, necessary. It really depends uh, on uh, many characteristics uh, of the defects. Uh, it depends uh, on where the site is and uh, not only uh, on, the, on the dimensions and also it depends on the, the, uh, the surface of the abdominal wall. Uh, and so it's my experience that uh, uh, nearly uh, half uh, patients of our uh, series uh, needs meshes uh, larger than uh, uh, 30 per 30 centimeters. Uh, many cases with uh, 45 per uh, seven um, per 60 centimeters, especially in case of huge, uh, uh, huge uh, midline hernia, where you can and you need to extend really toward the paravertebral uh, spaces, and uh, in case of uh, wide abdominal surface, as in case of obese patients. Uh, but nonetheless, in cases of small patients with uh, even uh, large defects, uh, is, it is not uh, always necessary. Or in case of partial, uh, partial tear, as you say before, uh, you don't need to put uh, uh, huge meshes. And so it depends uh, on many factors, but this is the, what I think uh, uh, is the, more, uh, the most important value of this technique is uh, extreme uh, versatility. Can I, I agree with you. And I think that if, you, if I need a larger piece of mesh and I don't have one, I can um, superpose two meshes. There's no problem at all. Okay. There's one question from the audience. Okay. Who would like to... Sorry, we have a raised hand from Hakan Gök who asked the yeah. question on the size of the mesh in the first place. Hakan? Yeah. Uh... Okay, I am the man who is asking the previous question. Uh, nice to meet you all. 
So, uh, my, my concern is to, for the, the sim, linear similars actually, because if if in in conventional is in hernia, if you go overlap five centimeters, is not enough for the linear seminars. If uh, for generally the rectus width around fifteen to eighteen centimeters. If you put the more ten centimeters over nearly thirty centimeters, so it's risky from a, a standard thirty centimeter width of a mesh at the linear seminars. Uh, the, the the length of the uh, hernia side is not important, I guess, because you have the area to go to the subxiphoid to the to the uh, coupers. But and, and I don't uh, believe the concept of the partial tar actually. Uh, if you if you do tar, it's probably it's a large uh, hernia because of the width of the uh, defect. So. Uh, I generally use is a fort, 45 by 60 and just cut some uh, edges uh, to accommodate the mesh to the area and it's not 30 by 30 at the end. Thank you. Okay. Would you like to say something, Uli, Camilo, Jose? No, I think that the partial tar, as Camilo said before, is a very important tool. Um, and I think that if yeah, the area is correct, but if you don't open the hernial ring, you have a smaller hern area than if you open it. If you open the whole incision from the xiphoid to the pubic bone, so you will have a very large area to be um, um, protected by the sheet. So that is... Uh... When we talk about these very big uh, sheets of meshes, which cover the whole muscular abdominal wall, what do you think about the function after insertion of such a big mesh? I have never, I have, unfortunately, I have looked, but I haven't found real good results uh, about studying function after tau in a larger series of patients. Well, I think that this is a very important question. And since we don't have an answer, we should only use meshes that have some kind of elasticity and stability of the pores until we have this answer. If we now start to use stiff meshes, we will probably be surprised in the future by the results. And I think that here the company that is sponsoring this meeting has uh, taken care of this uh, question and they have incorporated the the elasticity, the bidirectional elasticity and the pore stability during um, stress to their meshes. I think that we cannot do nothing more than to use uh, good meshes in this situation. Mm. Camilo, I have, I, I'm I, sorry, Jose. I, I have um, two comments. One is uh, partial tar. I, I, sorry, I don't like partial tar. Always, I have problems if I try to do a partial tar. Tar, uh, in my opinion, is an operation that consists in opening whole, the whole uh, uh, transfer muscle. If you do a, um, a partial tar, probably you don't need, uh, it, it's, a, it's not well indicated. You don't need a, the, the, that maneuver to close the abdomen. This is my opinion. Eh? I'm, I'm, uh, I try to do that, and I have bad experience with that. And uh, uh, this is uh, the first question. The second is that we, we don't use to measure the, uh, the the patient before the operation, and probably we have to do that uh, like uh, the tailor uh, uh, measure the patient to know what uh, is exactly the mesh that fits the patient. Uh, and it, it depends on the patient. Uh, one person of the public ask about the, uh, usually the, the most of the robotic surgeon use a 30 per 30 centimeters mesh. 
yes, in, in many cases is useful to do the, the dimensions of the defect and the patient. But you have to measure your patient before operating on. It's, it's uh, uh, again, again, it's my opinion. Okay. And uh, about uh, function, uh, we don't have data. We need data about that. I am. I, I'm not sure that uh, the function will be impaired after the, this type of operation, uh, because uh, as you know, some orthopedic surgeon cut the muscles in some uh, 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 operations and the patients have any effect in, in their functional uh, uh, of the muscle. Mm -hmm. So probably uh, the scar uh, would protect about that. What, what we know from a very recent study um, in midline patients, a, a study from, from Denmark, Jensen and co-workers, and the conclusion of his study was that the difference between, in the distance between the rectus muscle is responsible for functional deficits. If you reconstruct the muscle, then you can reconstruct the function. That seems from a histological point of view to be quite clear in his study. Yes, because the, the, the rectus muscle is the uh, main ventral uh, uh, flexor of the trunk. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's, yeah. it's the main muscle in the movement. There's one other question from the audience concerning pretreatment of the abdominal wall in tar. That means Botox. First of all, Julio, do you think that you, you mentioned Botox in your presentation? Do you think that also in your Lira technique, Botox is um, a helpful adjunct? Well, it's, it would be an option, like in a ribs, laparoscopic ribs, uh, to reduce the tar indication by minimal invasive surgery. But uh, I didn't mention the Botox in my presentation. Okay. We have, because we don't have experience in Botox mm -hmm. currently. Okay. Um, Camilo? Camilo, what uh, do you yes. have experience? Do you think Botox is helpful? We have uh, a few experience with the preoperative uh, Botox uh, administration, uh, but uh, we're a successful experience. And I truly think that uh, Botox uh, should be implemented uh, in order to avoid uh, uh, tar when not strictly necessary. Uh, as we say before, we have to uh, tailor it, uh, uh, the best surgical approach uh, uh, depending on the patients that we have to deal with. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, useful, uh, useful and promising uh, uh, tool uh, for uh, some uh, complex even not so much uh, uh, complex cases uh, the main things I, uh, that is useful uh, is to convert the indication uh, from uh, a tar to uh, simple reefs or uh, even uh, iPhone plus uh, technique okay Uli I have used uh, the uh, Botox in some selected cases, but uh, since I perform the robotic TAR, I have not, um, in my patient population, I have to acknowledge that our hernias are not so large, Camilo, as your hernias. Um, um, I, I have not seen the need in my patient population to, to do something more than a TAR. Okay. Jose, uh, Jose what says the registry and your own experience? Yes, in the registry, uh, in TAR patients have a 13% uh, of patients receive uh, Botox before the operation and 3% uh, of patients with an, uh, anterior component separation. Uh, probably this will increase uh, during the years, but because uh, Botox has been introduced in our country uh, recently, two years ago, uh, has been increasing. Uh, my experience with Botox is uh, sometimes when I use Botox, 
in a patient that I am thinking to do a TAR or a component separation <clears throat> uh, after the Botox, uh, some patients don't need uh, the TAR. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I could do a retromuscular uh, repair um, very nicely and without any problem. And in larger defects, help to uh, act, uh, reduce the, the contents of the hernia and help to close the defect. So in my opinion, I, I'm uh, using increasing my use of Botox in patients, including some patients with defects uh, smaller than 10, 10 centimeters uh, transverse. Okay. <clears throat> Concerning pretreatment or additional intraoperative treatment, there is also uh, the possibilities to stretch the abdominal wall. You can, there's a, um, a possibility to, um, to standardize, to, standard, uh, to a standardized um, stretching of the abdominal wall. That can be done, of course, only in open procedures as up to now and not in uh, minimal invasive or robotic procedures. Is there any experience from your side? No. No, nobody. Okay, but this should be kept in mind. A last question, if there are no other questions in the audience. A last question concerning the Spanish registry. <clears throat> I, as you have heard, I'm a little bit old fashioned and I like the anterior component separation technique. And you only, you only compare ACS with PCS, but you did not differentiate the old ACS with the newer ones perforating, perforator sparing uh, anterior component separation, it's not possible in your registry, I suppose. No, it's not possible. We only have uh, uh, to check uh, anterior and posterior component separation. Uh, mm. in the, uh, when you have a big uh, uh, data for collect, when you introduce more data, you have more uh, uh, loose of data, uh, more mm -hmm. loose data, because uh, uh, it's, it's very difficult uh, to uh, sit down after the operation and put all the data into the computer. It's very difficult. We have uh, very busy or thinking other things. Uh, I want to uh, thank all the uh, colleagues that introduced their, their data in in already see because I understand that it's very difficult and it's a larger number of, of data. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Thank you very much once more. So I think we have, can we have used 10 minutes more than previously suggested? There's one, one patient, uh, no, I'm sorry, one patient. <laughs> <laughs> One colleague, I suppose from Italy, <coughs> raised hand. Is it possible to hear the que the, her question? Constantine? Uh, yes, Kameri Rivilla. You from Spain. Spain. She's from Spain. From Spain. Rivilla. Okay, Rivilla. I'm sorry. You just have to unmute yourself and you may speak. So oh, I'm sorry, I don't hear anything. No, still on mute, but sadly nothing we can do from this side except for giving the, the permission. So it does not work. Is it my fault? No, no, I think, I think uh, Carmen Rivia herself has to, has to unmute the mic on, on, on their end. Otherwise uh, we, can, we can only give the permission to do so. Okay, I think it doesn't work. 
So I think we can come to an end. My dog knocked at the door and asked for dinner. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> there are no further, no further questions. Thank you very much to the audience. Thank you very much even more to the speakers. It was a pleasure for me. I learned a lot. And I think um, we can shortly summarize that the uh, Lira technique is a technique who should be used in special cases. There are two other participants. If it's possible that, that we can hear them, then we will do it. I think the Lira technique should be followed on and we will see what happens when some more surgeons will use the technique. And that will be really very interesting. Concerning the TAR, in my opinion, the TAR is a very important, um, very important tool. And it has been shown that it really works not only in specialized, ha specialized hands, but also in, uh, in the, as I said, broad field of surgery as shown by the Spanish registry. But nevertheless, the TAR is a component separation technique and it destroys to a, sec to a special extent extent to a certain extent the anatomy and we do not know enough today to recently to 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 really um, propose that a lot of people need uh, the component separation techniques there are a lot of complications as shown in the Spanish registry and the, the, the complications are a little bit lower, the complication rate are, is a little bit lower uh, for TAR than for ACS, but nevertheless, it's a quite high complication rate. And we have some possibilities with pretreatment of these patients. And Dr. Pereira showed that in his experience when using Botox, it's possible sometimes not to do um, component separation, to restrict to a reefs procedure. And I think that is the more anatomical procedure, the simple reefs procedure, the simple sublate procedure. So in my opinion, it was a very interesting afternoon. I want to thank all of you. And I hope this very short summary has really pointed out what all of you wanted to say. Is it right? Are you satisfied? Yeah, everybody says okay. <laughs> so, Konstantin, thank you very much for the opportunity to perform such an interesting meeting. I enjoyed it really, really very much. And I, said, I see some thanks from all over the world, even from Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, also from all of us at Dynamash. Thank you very much to all attendees. Thank you much to our excellent panelists, Dr. Menchero, Dr. Betolio, Dr. Dietz, Dr. Pereira, um, to our brilliant host, Professor Berger. Thank you very much. Really excellent session. I, for once, can say I learned a lot. Um, if uh, from the audience there are any further questions that we didn't get to now or you think of later, um, feel free to email us at uh, webinar at dyna-mesh.com. We'll make sure that we forward these questions to, to one of the panelists or the entire panel um, and get back to you as soon as possible. So once again, thank you. Everyone take care, stay healthy, and we'll see you all in the next online session here. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, you Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.